I was impressed, uh, most impressed by the list of uh, speakers uh, who have appeared today. Uh, a distinguished group uh, who really cover the gamut, I think, on, on, on the Middle East, uh, which remains one of the most complex and, and dangerous regions in the world. If you've been watching TV at all today, you, you'll understand how pleased I am to be in Orlando today. <laughs> It's, all, it's always great to be out of Washington and away from the United States Congress, which has become a powerful argument for downsizing from three branches of government to two. In the 1980s, Congress became known as the only daycare center Ronald Reagan didn't close. Lately, it's become a living example of leave no child behind. The congressman is clapping. <laughs> it didn't used to be that way, but it is. Now, you all may have heard that there's an election coming up uh, five weeks uh, from tomorrow. This clearly is shaping up as the election of a lifetime. Exciting, groundbreaking, historic, no matter the outcome, with plot twists so bizarre that if you pitched a movie with this storyline, it would be rejected as too far-fetched. On the Democratic side during the primary, you had graduates of Harvard and Yale go from bars to bowling alleys to Dairy Queens, trying to identify with regular folks, trying to prove that they really do prefer beer and burgers to arugula and Chardonnay. And who can ever forget Barack Obama bowling, throwing a gutter ball while wearing a tie? Then there was the time that Hillary Clinton, who for years has been an advocate of gun control, but suddenly during the primary, she has these flashbacks to her youthful experiences shooting a gun, leading Barack Obama to complain that he, she was making it sound like she was Annie Oakley. Whether you would vote for Hillary Clinton or not, you have to admit that that woman was a warrior. She so, showed grit. She showed grace. She certainly answered the question of whether a woman, a woman is tough enough and has the fortitude to be commander-in-chief. But she did have some embarrassing moments. One of her most difficult periods was when she got caught embellishing a bit about a trip to Bosnia, claiming that when she landed, she had to run into the building to avoid sniper fire. Well, surprisingly, Vice President Cheney came to her defense. He said we should go easy on Senator Clinton, that her claim to have been running from gunfire in Bosnia was an honest mistake. Cheney said she had merely confused her trip to Bosnia with the time he took her quail hunting. <laughs> now, the Republican contest also has been full of surprises. Rudy Giuliani, the front runner a year ago, spent $65 million for a single, de a single delegate. And the winner turned out to be a guy who was written off for dead a year ago, John McCain. And just when you thought there wouldn't be any more plot twists, here comes Governor Sarah Palin, Sarah Barracuda, as she was known in her basketball days. Now, some folks have noted similarities between Governor, Ch Governor Palin and the current Vice President, Dick Cheney. They're both conservative. They're both from the West, both members of the NRA, and both hunters. But humorous Dave Barry points out that Palin is actually a lot better shot and goes after moose, which is a large studly animal, whereas Cheney hunts doves and elderly lawyers. <laughs> now, the vice president, to his eternal credit, is a really good sport about being the butt of a lot of jokes these days. Uh, Cheney said that earlier this year he asked his wife, Lynn, uh, if it bugged her that people often referred to him as Darth Vader. And he says his wife replied, no, dear, it humanizes you. <laughs> now, as everyone here knows, these are turbulent political times and almost no one in Washington gets along anymore. I am not siding with any presidential candidate when I say Washington really is broken. Beyond the well-documented divide between red states and blue states, much of Washington is consumed by a culture of extreme partisanship 
that reduces even the most serious issues to fodder in the never-ending struggle for partisan advantage. It takes a 9-11, or the economic version of a 9-11, to get the various parties in Washington to work to get, uh, together and address critical issues. And as today shows, sometimes even that doesn't work. Most of the time, in the culture of extreme partisanship, no accusation is too poisonous or too vicious, and many politicians no longer even think twice about saying something they know not to be true. There's also a huge disconnect between what happens in Washington and the lives of most Americans, which is what I think is, is fueling this great hunger for change in this country. This toxic, often petty atmosphere that consumes Washington is especially troublesome because it comes at a time when we as a country face a difficult mix of highly complex issues. I will talk a little bit today about the staggering challenges awaiting the next president, about this amazing campaign, where we are today, and what to watch for in the next few weeks. And then comes my favorite part, which is when I get to answer all your questions. But first, since all of us view the world through the lens of our own experiences and background, I want to just tell you a little bit about where I come from. Um, I grew up in a tiny town of 6,700 people in southwest Missouri. I've always been fascinated by politics and government, but I couldn't bear the thought of asking people for money, and my political views didn't really fit in any one political party. So I decided to go into journalism. I never had any intention to go into television. In fact, when I was at the University of Missouri getting a degree in journalism, my father begged me to take a course in broadcasting. He said, honey, TV is the medium of the future. I, of course, refused, said, no, Dad, I'm going to be a serious journalist. Having grown up in a small town, I was really eager to get to the, the big city. So I proceeded, I went to Washington and proceeded to get turned down by every name brand journalism operation in the vicinity every newspaper, magazine, newsletter. The, the, the low point of my job search was when I went to this little all no news radio station and got turned down by a guy wearing his lunch on his shirt. I rationalized that I really didn't want to work there anyway because he didn't know the difference between Kansas and Missouri, uh, which I uh, thought was an unforgivable factual error. Finally, I did get a, a job with a little outfit, a little newsletter operation called the Bureau of National Affairs. Um, I frankly think the managing editor just got worn down. The job was supposed to be for someone with a year or two of experience and uh, to cover taxes and economics. I'd never seen a tax form, and I had had one college course in economics. But after five months of letters and phone calls and two trips to Washington, I managed to persuade him that I was absolutely perfect for the job. I eventually worked my way up in the newspaper world, um, often aided by the fact that I was a woman, they needed women at the time, and I came cheap. The moment that probably propelled me into television was when I was covering the Carter White House for the now defunct Washington Star, which was then owned by Time Magazine. Now, as you probably all have heard, Presidents like to end their news conferences by, with some softball or oddball question. This was the fall of 1980. It was a heated campaign between President Carter and then Governor Ronald Reagan. Um, I had only been covering the White House for a few months, and at 28 may have appeared to be a sweet young thing. So President Carter called on me, and I asked a somewhat sassy question, and he basically just blew me off. And... I, but I stood there and repeated the question. And he, at that point, started, denied something that everyone had him on tape saying. And the exchange led all three evening news broadcasts. And that propelled, that caused me to get a number of offers uh, in television, which just shows you that uh, often your life can, be, can turn on something that was a totally unscripted moment rather than the product of some great career plan. I went on to cover the Reagan White House for the Washington Star until that newspaper uh, folded. And then um, 
NBC hired me essentially in spite of my audition. Um, in one way or another, I've covered nine presidential campaigns, six presidential administrations, and just a, uh, more scandals than my, I have fingers and toes to count. Uh, in, in looking back over the years, it, it really does seem that, that this year's election, that the stakes do seem higher than they have ever been, with the possible ex exception of 1980 when there was also tremendous hunger for change in this country. For the next president, getting elected may actually be the easy part. Who prevails, whoever prevails in this race, faces a staggering list of complex issues. An economy struggling to recover from what economists say is the most serious financial crisis since the Great Depression. A meltdown which has shattered confidence and put a serious dent in everyone's savings. A health care system in which costs are soaring and more than 46 million Americans lack insurance. Families struggling with high gasoline and food costs. It's clear that millions of Americans really are hurting. Now internationally, the next president faces an equally troubled war world full of daunting challenges. There's, we have, we're fighting two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's also the renewed threat of Russia Iran's march toward nuclear weapons, North Korea, which U.S. intelligence believes already has one or more nuclear weapons, and the global war on terror. The war on terror has become something of a political football, but the threat remains very real. It once took a nation to threaten the security of our country. Now it only takes a few terrorists willing to die uh, in order to create mass casualties mass casualties in our cities. The most important task of our next president is to prevent Al-Qaeda or some like-minded group from gaining control of a nuclear device and detonating it in this country. Everything else pales in comparison. This is the nightmare scenario in the national security community. Beyond that, there is the continuing battle to degrade the capabilities of Al-Qaeda. Though the U.S. has successfully disrupted Al-Qaeda over the last few year, uh, years, knocking out uh, some of its top commanders, Al-Qaeda once again has training camps in the tribal areas of Pakistan preparing for attacks against the West. The CIA says Al-Qaeda has been bringing in operatives for training who look Western and who would not attract your attention if they were standing behind you in line at the airport. Last week, Defense Secretary Bob Gates said, what is going on in Western Pakistan today poses the greatest threat to the security of the U.S. homeland of any spot in the world. Then there is Iraq. Secretary Gates, who's developed a reputation as a pretty straight shooter, says we're now in the end game in Iraq. Clearly the surge has brought significant security gains, though General Petraeus warns that these gains are fragile. One of the very first decisions the next president will have to make is how much to draw down troops in Iraq and how many of those troops to send to Afghanistan, where the threat posed by the Taliban has grown. In the last few weeks, more American troops have been killed in Afghanistan than in Iraq. Now, the candidates have laid out a pretty clear positions on how they'd proceed in Iraq. Senator McCain has said, we cannot settle for anything less than victory. The consequences are too great. He opposes any set timetable for drawing, draw, drawing down troops, says that must be determined by conditions on the ground. Senator Obama vows to begin bringing troops home as soon as he takes office and to have virtually all troops out of Iraq within 16 months. That's what their campaign promises are. The reality is, is that whoever wins the Oval Office almost certainly will have to adapt his or her campaign commitments to reflect the cold, hard realities of the facts on the ground. Former Secretary of State Colin Powell put it best when he said, whoever assumes office will face a U.S. military force that cannot sustain 140,000 troops deployed in Iraq and 25,000 troops deployed in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So the new president will have to draw down troops at some, at some pace. But Powell also says the new president won't be able to just say, we're out of here, turn off the lights, we're gone. 
Another vaccine issue is Iran and its march toward nuclear weapons. Iran's government is still stonewalling international inspectors trying to investigate evidence that Iran has secretly worked on a nuclear bomb and the missile warhead technology needed to deliver the weapon. The International Atomic Energy Agency says that in recent months, Iran has improved its ability to produce nuclear fuel and overcome technical challenges, proceeding in direct defiance of the directives of the UN Security Council. The US and Europe clearly want to ratchet up pressure on Iran through tougher sanctions, but Russia has made it clear it will not allow further sanctions to be imposed through the UN Security Council where it has a veto. The problem is that to the extent to the <clears throat> excuse me, to the extent the US and the West seem unable to slow Iran through diplomatic means, it increases the possibility that Israel will feed the that Israel will feel, will feel the need to take unilateral military action against Iran's nuclear facilities. Israel sees a nuclear bomb in the hands of Iran as a threat to its very existence and believes Tehran will have a bomb by this time, some, by, some, by, by sometime next year, or they will have enough enriched uranium for a bomb by sometime next year. So the clock is ticking. Many Israelis believe the country simply cannot allow Iran to build a bomb, even if taking action against Iran would incur, would incur condemnation around the world. That's why Israel has been so public about flexing its muscles and building up its airstrike capabilities. Israel believes that even if bombing can't destroy Iran's nuclear program, it can cripple the effort and buy some time. And when you're the country who believes that you're going to be on the receiving end of a nuclear weapon on, uh, on top of a missile, uh, the, what the rest of the world thinks doesn't, in the end, matter all that much. Now, with all this going on in the world, the traditional issues that have usually dominated discussion of the, in the Middle East, trying to find an elusive peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, simply has not been a top priority and is not likely to be a key focus, at least initially, of the next president. In fact, that traditional Middle Eastern issues are hardly mentioned during this campaign. Secretary of State Condi Rice has put considerable effort into trying to get a deal between Israel and the Palestinians before President Bush leaves office. She made 16 trips to the region in the past in the past 21 months and hosted the conference at Annapolis. But this month, both Israel and Palestinian leaders said that a deal is not likely to happen by the end of this year. Both leaders of those leaders said a deal is possible, perhaps sometimes, sometime next year, but that I would emphasize the word possible. The reality in the Middle East is that neither side has really fully lived up to its obligations under the peace process or carried out steps that were supposed to have been uh, taken to build confidence. Israel was supposed to stop building settlements and remove illegal outposts. That hasn't happened. The Palestinians were supposed to dismantle terrorist infrastructures, and that certainly hasn't happened either. With all the problems we face internationally and domestically, I sometimes wonder why anyone would want to take over in January, but we seem not to have a shortage of those interested in the position. Now, I'd like to take a poll um, with a show of hands. How many in this audience support Barack Obama? How many of you previously supported Hillary Clinton? How many of you support John McCain? Any of you previously support Hillary? One of you. Anyone? Two of you. Okay. Uh, anyone uh, in this room undecided? Oh, well, quite a few. Okay. <laughs> you may be lobbied. You may be very sorry you put up your hand. This truly has been an amazing election season, with record turnouts for Democratic primaries in state after state, and millions of new voters getting involved. 
Both Democratic candidates shattered fundraising records, and Obama basically turned the Internet into an ATM. What we are left at this point, in my view, are two very strong candidates. Senator Obama has laid out a fresh, compelling message which electrifies audiences and mobilizes new voters. I can't think of another politician in my lifetime who could get 75,000 people to show up at a football stadium for a political speech, other than perhaps Congressman Fry, of course. <laughs> Obama has had some missteps, uh, but for the most part, he's run what most would agree was a masterful campaign. This is a guy with only three years in the Senate who upset the ruling family of the Democratic Party, the Clintons. Some Democrats call the Obama campaign the best run campaign they have seen in 20 years. Consistent, disciplined, politically savvy, and technologically savvy in mining the power of the Internet. Senator McCain's political journey has been less exciting until recently, but equally remarkable. He has demonstrated tremendous determination and resilience, having come back from the political dead. Last summer, he was flat broke, his campaign, campaign had blown through $25 million, he had to lay off most of his staff, he was traveling alone, and was down to a one-state strategy, win New Hampshire. But the guy persevered, he never gave up, and he never lost his sense of humor. Uh, in fact, he took to quoting Chairman Mao. He said, quote, in the words of Chairman Mao, it's always darkest before it's totally black. <laughs> McCain has managed to make this race close largely because of his own personal qualities. He is a genuine hero with a compelling personal story, and he's a maverick with a record of taking on his own party at times. Both of those things are helpful in a political landscape, which is exceedingly difficult for Republicans. You know, personal qualities tend to be really important when, in picking a president, perhaps more than other uh, spots on the ticket. People want to have a comfort level with the individual and to be able to, to feel that, that, that there is a, a sense of who they are and, and that they're someone that they can stand to have in their homes for you know, four years. A pollster who's been in this business for a very long time, uh, his name is Peter Hart. He now does the NBC News poll. Um, but he's highly respected and over the years, he's had various tricks that he used to try to get focus groups to tell him what they really think about a candidate. The question Peter Hart likes to ask focus groups is this. If candidate X were a member of the family, which member would they be? In 1988, George Herbert Walker Bush was viewed as a father figure of the WASPy variety. In 1992, Bill Clinton was viewed as the teenage brother, which turned out to be rather perceptive <laughs> and prophetic. This spring, Peter Hart asked the same question. McCain was viewed as the uncle, though not the avuncular one, so he has warmth issues. Obama was viewed as the respected brother, but not necessarily ready to hand over the family business to him. And Hillary was viewed as the mother-in-law or stepmother, <laughs> which underscores the reason she probably didn't quite make it. She's, she's, tal she's talented, but a polarizing figure with a lot of baggage, at least in the eyes of some Americans. Let's have another show of hands. How many people think that John McCain made a good decision in selecting Sarah Palin? How many think he made a bad decision? All right. Well, I can tell you from his smile and his body language that John McCain thinks he made a good decision. Um, I've never seen him as happy on the campaign trail as he was in the two weeks after he selected Sarah Palin. As a journalist, I express no opinion about whether someone is qualified to be president or vice president or which candidate is best qualified. That's not what I talk about. I talk about the politics of it. So each of you get to decide who's qualified and who isn't. But in analyzing the politics of the matter, I believe the Palin decision, though risky, really gave McCain his best chance 
to win this race. Here's the, here's the situation that McCain was facing. Obama had had a strong convention, generated a lot of excitement, and got what he needed from the Clintons, who were on board at least publicly. Even though McCain had managed to keep the race reasonably close over the summer, Obama was heading into the fall with a definite lead and with tremendous advantages. Choosing Governor Romney or Minnesota Governor Pawlenty or even a Democrat, Joe Lieberman, wasn't likely to fundamentally change the race or generate much excitement, uh, which was one of the problems McCain was having in his own party. Enter Sarah Palin. First of all, she has indisputably generated excitement and energized key parts of the Republican base that weren't all that thrilled with McCain. That translates into volunteers and turnout on election day, which is critical since Republicans this year do not have as good a ground game as the Democrats. Second, picking Palin was so out of the box that it caused some voters to reassess their thinking about John McCain because they thought, hey, this is not your typical white guy Republican. He picked a woman. That helped him. Third, picking Palin helped McCain pivot to a new message. No longer was his emphasis on, an, on experience, which hadn't paid off for Hillary. Instead, he repackaged himself as the change candidate, the maverick. He could say, look who I've got next to me, two mavericks, change is coming. Now, Sarah Palin has had some bad days. She's certainly taken hits on the veracity of some of her claimed accomplishments, and she struggled during some interviews. But so far, many Americans find the moose dressing hockey mom refreshing. Some like to say, hey, she's like me. So they identify with her. It's interesting because some of the celebrity status and fascination that has helped Obama this year now has, has transferred over to Sarah Palin. Let me ask you all another question. Assuming you could go to dinner with just one of the four people running for president or vice president, Obama, Biden, McCain, or Palin, which one would you choose? Who would choose Obama? Who would choose Joe Biden? It's more than usual. Uh, who would choose McCain? Who would choose Sarah Palin? All right, well, we, when we asked that question, when we asked that question in the latest NBC News poll, here's what we got. 40% chose Obama, 33% chose Palin, 15% chose McCain, and 7% chose Biden. Now, Joe Biden obviously was not selected to be Obama's vice president because he generates excitement. He was chosen because of his foreign policy credentials and because if Obama gets elected, Joe Biden probably can help him govern. However, last week Obama did have a case of foot and mouth disease. First, Biden got into hot water after he criticized an Obama ad that mocked McCain as an out of touch computer illiter illiterate who doesn't use email. McCain, by the way, has trouble typing because of his POW injuries, which is one of the reasons he doesn't use these things. So Biden pronounced the ad terrible and said it would not have run if he'd known about it. Well, the Obama campaign later, out of, later put out a statement clarifying Obama's remarks. I mean, I'm sorry, the Obama campaign put out a statement clarifying Biden's remarks, how he really had meant to say that if he'd only known these things, he really wouldn't have objected to the ad. Another major gaffe by uh, Senator Biden came when, when he was criticizing the Bush administration's handling of the financial meltdown. Biden recalled how FDR had gone on television when the stock market crashed to explain to Americans what had happened. Well, there was a problem. Herbert Hoover was president in 1929, and TV wasn't introduced to the public until a decade later at the 1939 World's Fair. One of the nice things about this election so far is that voters seem reasonably happy with their choices, at least at the top of the ticket. Um, though, though, the, though the unfavorables of just about every politician have gone up during this financial meltdown, 
both Obama and McCain still have higher positives than Bush and John Kerry did four years ago. So where do we stand today with 36 days to go? When you sift through the polls and you talk to the pollsters, basically it comes down to this. Obama has a small but growing lead. The race remains close in most of the battleground states. Um, the last two weeks of focus on the financial well, meltdown really has wiped out the progress that uh, McCain had made in the polls or during and after the Republican conventions. Still, McCain's gains back there were really important because the, for the first time in this race, at, during that period, the Obama people came to believe, hey, we really could lose this. And the McCain people came to believe, hey, we got a shot at winning this thing. Now, privately, both sides would, would agree that all the key barometers right now favor Obama, at least the ones we traditionally use to look at in terms of determining the outcome of a presidential race. And McCain still faces some of the most difficult political terrain I've ever seen facing a, a Republican presidential candidate in my career. McCain has to deal with a profoundly unpopular Republican president, a country in which 70% of voters think we're going in the wrong direction, an unpopular war, though that has receded as an issue, an economy in or flirting with recession, and a financial meltdown that has seriously shaken confidence and stressed out voters over their shrinking 401ks. Also consider this fact. Only once in 60 years has this country voted to keep the same party in the White House for three elections in a row. Then there's the age factor. McCain is 72. And I should note that it's really tough for pollsters to measure voter prejudices, by, but by all the measures they have at their disposal, plus their own intuition, there seem to be far more people in this country who are resistant to uh, electing a 72-year-old president than are, than are resistant to electing an African-American president. Now, all this points to a fascinating few weeks ahead as each side tries to frame this race to his candidate's advantage. McCain's campaign manager argues the contest will be decided more on personalities and perceptions than issues. He has to hope that because if it's on issues, McCain is gone. The Democrats argue that the race will be decided on the issues, especially the economy, where Obama has a distinct advantage right now. Um, and on the question on who voters most trust to handle an economic crisis, again, where Obama has an advantage. Clearly, the last couple of weeks have been rocky for McCain as the financial earthquake brought attention back to the economy. He fumbled the issue initially. Um, Democrats have been pounding him as a continuation of the failed uh, Bush economic philosophy. One of the most intense battles in the next few weeks, and these are kind of fun to watch when you know which groups of voters the, the candidates are most going after. <clears throat> they're, they're basically focused on two groups. One are the Reagan Democrats, who are the blue collar, often culturally conservative Democrats who helped elect Ronald Reagan. The other group they're focusing in on a lot are women. That's reflected in the candidates' advertising buys. Uh, initially, um, the first news programs always get the most presidential campaign dollars. But this year, right after the news programs, the, the show getting the most presidential ads is Oprah. And McCain is buying more time, more time on Oprah than Obama, even though Obama, even though Oprah has supported Obama. Now, in recent elections, Democrats have carried unmarried women, while Republicans have carried married ones. Women, women overall tend to go Democratic, while white women tend to go Republican. Right now, both campaigns are especially focused on white working class women and suburban women in key states. In the past years, you may have heard a lot about soccer moms. 
Well, the de new demographic that's, that's in vogue this year is the Walmart woman. A Walmart woman shops at Walmart at least once a week, makes less than $60,000 a year, doesn't like President Bush, and tends to think of herself as independent. McCain thinks he can get to reach these women because he's a maverick and because a lot of these women, he thinks, can identify with someone like Sarah Palin or at least would be, are open to him because of him uh, showing that he is concerned about some of those kinds of issues. Obama is going after these women on issues, abortion, uh, pay equity, the economy, and health care. Last question, how many of you watched the debate on Friday night? How many of you thought Obama won? How many of you thought McCain won? How many of you thought it was a draw? Pretty evenly divided. Well, both sides the believe that the debates will be absolutely critical this year. Obama clearly has an edge about, among voters who want change. He is viewed as the candidate most able to deliver change. To close the deal, though, he has to persuade voters that despite his limited experience, he can be trusted in the Oval Office, that he is strong and forceful enough to be commander in chief. McCain's job in these debates is much more complicated. He needs to prove that he'll be much different than President Bush, that he understands what, he's go what is going on in people's lives, and that he has a plan to fix the economy. McCain also has got to make up ground with Obama on, in terms of increasing voters' trust in him uh, and his ability to handle an economic crisis. Since he's behind in the race, McCain also needs to make something happen in these debates. He's got to make, he's got a, you know, a little more than a month now to try to change the dynamics and get back some of the ground he lost in the last two weeks. As you might expect, the vice presidential debate on Thursday night of this week will be more important than usual this year because the jury is still out on Sarah Palin. The latest NBC News, news poll finds a mixed bag. More voters still view her, excuse me, more voters still view Palin positively than negatively, 42% to 36%. 52% say they would be very or fairly comfortable if Palin became vice president. But when you ask them about is she qualified to be president, 49% of, of Americans say no, 40% of Americans say yes. All that makes it imperative that Palin on Thursday proves in her, these debates that she has what it takes to be a heartbeat away from the presidency. Imagine for a moment what this night would be like if Barack Obama had chosen Hillary Clinton to be vice president. As Maureen Dowd put it, it would be the clash of the titans. Sarah Barracuda, the gun-toting hockey mom, against the shot-swilling warrior queen of the sister of the traveling pantsuits. Bottom line is that today this race remains reasonably close, but moving in Obama's direction. There are plenty of danger signs in our poll for McCain. There are also some for Obama, though, though not as many. Um, a key thing is that McCain, though, still leads among independents, which is one of the reasons he's been able to keep the race reasonably close. The final weeks will be fast-paced fast and highly charged Voters have a clear choice on the big issues of our time. The only thing we can count on is what Tom Brokaw calls the UFO factor, the unforeseen occurring. It's happened at every other stage of this race, so there's no reason there's not going to be a lot of stuff we haven't thought of in the next few weeks. But bottom line, for those of us who are political junkies, it's going to be a great, great race. Uh, I wanted to get back to this question of Israel and, and Iran and the nuclear bomb and so on. Uh, some would argue that the reason uh, a lot of uh, people in the Islamic world, certainly on the main streets of Islamic world, that uh, they find that what really 
sets them away from the U.S. is the support that the U.S. has for Israel and that most people, again, on the main streets in Islamic countries would really be looking at the, at, at the treatment that Israel meets out to the Palestinians. Uh, having said that, would you, uh, would you uh, think that the U.S. support or, or rather the tacit support because if Israel is going to go after the nuclear bomb or nuclear uh, 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 buildings and, and so on in, in Israel, that basically it will not be done unless the U.S. agrees to it and that would actually end up then alienating the Islamic world even further. I do think if it happens, it most likely will further alienate the Islamic world. Um, I think that Israel would like to have a green light and help from the U.S. I can't say definitively that they would never do it without a green light from the U.S. There are very strong feelings in that country and about the about you know the president of Iran has basically uh, vowed to exterminate Israel, and they're concerned that it's not just rhetoric. And so when they see that Iran making progress toward the technical know-how to build a bomb and the materials to build a bomb and the delivery systems, um, they believe that they have a finite period of time to deal with the issue. I think actually the, one of the things that the Israeli government is concerned about is that if Barack Obama is elected, that the their dealings with the U.S. may become more difficult and that there have been some discussions in that government if whether they need to make, uh, are going to have to make a decision before this administration ends. Clearly, when you talk to policymakers in the Bush administration, they do not want this to happen. They do not, no one is giving Israel a green light to attack Iran. Uh, they're, in fact, that uh, Bob Gates and others have gone out of their way to, um, to say that there really are not any good military options. Uh, the problem is that as long as Russia is being unhelpful at the UN Security Council, there's a, there, there aren't a lot, of, a lot of other ways to try to make Tehran understand or put pressure on them to change their behavior. There's been some discussion, I think, of, of doing um, embar a further embargo among the Western countries who do a lot of trading with Iran to try to use that kind of pressure or, or even a carrot and stick approach to, to try to dissuade Iran from taking those final steps. Um, but I don't, you know, I think that you make very good points. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that anyone knows how this is going to end. Um, and you know, if, if Israel does strike Iran, the, the, the um, results could be uh, very, uh, could be cataclysmic around the world. And I think they're, you're talking about uh, a serious impact on, on the oil supply because Iran is likely to stop exports. Um, there's concern that, that Iran would then give Hezbollah the green light to attack in the United States, which they've never done before. So there are all kinds of ramifications, um, and I, I think that, that this is going to be one of the foremost challenges for the next president. I was wondering what it's like to report in the Middle East as an American and as a woman. I have not reported, I, I've been to uh, Lebanon and Israel and Jordan. I have not been to Saudi Arabia. I think it would be more difficult. I know a lot of women who have done reporting in Saudi Arabia, and I think you have to do some, you have to be mindful, wherever you go as a journalist in the world, you need to be mindful of local customs and, and, and local values and not do things that, that upset your, your hosts unnecessarily. Um, I love the country of Jordan. Jordan is east meets west. It's got, uh, it, it's a combination of, the, 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 of Europe and the Arabic world. And if you've never been there, I, I encourage you to go. It's a fascinating place. As an American, I felt very w welcome in Jordan. Now, maybe I shouldn't have because a few months later they bombed 
there were problems at three, at two or three of the hotels. But I, I found the Jord Jordanians very welcoming. Their king is uh, an ally of the United States. Um, Israel, of course, is an ally. Americans feel very at home in Israel. Lebanon, the people there are quite nice. Um, you know, I, I think that in the more, um, uh, in, in, in places like Saudi Arabia, it would be more difficult. Places like Syria, it's, it's tougher, I think, to be an American because of the relationship there. But it really, I think, varies country by country. I know people who've been, I, I was supposed to go to Egypt, but I had to cut short my trip, and uh, people who work in Egypt have no problem at all as an American. There are certain tourist areas you need to stay away from because they tend to be the areas that get most of the bombings. But other than that, I think it's, it's a fascinating place for anyone to go, male or female. Uh, with the combination of increase in Russian power and the troubling Russo-American uh, relations be a worry for the next administration? Oh, absolutely. It complicates everything. It complicates dealing with Iran. Um, it, com it complicates some of the NATO issues. Um, you know, I think that, that th there's been a long progression of, of American administrations who have tried to bring, uh, the so bring Russia into the... Uh, you know, into the, it's not right to say the civilized world, but into, into an increasingly collaborative effort with the West. And clearly by Russia's bad behavior in Georgia, uh, the assassination of, of journalists who have the audacity to criticize the, the regime, uh, people who have been dealing for Russia, with Russia for the years say this is, they, they very, there definitely has been serious step backward. And how you, the Bush administration has made a decision not to blow up the relationship and not to take punitive steps that box Russia in and would force them to react negatively. So what they're trying to do is they're, uh, in, terms of, in terms of dealing with their bad behavior, what they're doing is stopping to push for things that Russia wants, but not taking punitive actions for the most part that would cause uh, Russia to take further negative actions. But one of the th key things is th that they're watching for is whether Russia, in the areas in which it's occupied, Georgia is going to start extracting minerals. If, if, if Russia goes to that point, then the, 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 um, the U.S. and the West are going to have to figure out how they deal with that clear, clear indication that Russia is not planning to leave that country. What are your thoughts about uh, impending foreign relations for the next, the upcoming president, whoever he may be, and uh, dealing with the energy crisis that um, America is in? And, you know, because OPEC and all the oil companies, most of them happen to be in the Middle East. So what kind of ramifications do you think the energy crisis is going to have on Middle Eastern foreign relations? I think the energy cr uh, crisis is going to be very high on the agenda of whoever the next president is. And, you know, Obama and, and McCain disagree primarily on two big issues. One is drilling off the uh, offshore drilling in the U.S., um, and the other issue is nuclear power. Um, McCain believes basically you need to pursue every single option to have energy independence. Uh, Obama wants to focus more on alternative energies and and not go with the traditional drill, not do more drilling in offshore areas of the United States, although he has said he would be willing to consider that if that were the price of getting a deal. But I think that who, whoever the next president is will make um, a, a plan to achieve energy independence in a finite period of time at the very top of his agenda because it, it impacts our national security. As, as you've seen Boone Pickens ads, we're shipping, what, $700 billion overseas to pay for oil? Imagine what that could do in this country. Um, and so I think the, the faster we can get, it also makes us much more dependent on um, and much more vulnerable to the actions of countries who are not our friends. So I, would, I think both of these candidates view energy independence as a national security issue, not just a domestic issue. Yes, so Lou Dobbs of CNN was recently quoted at the Values Voter Summit in Washington, D.C. to call the liberal media's coverage of this election a censorship of free thought. 
And as a part of CNN, an outspokenly liberal media news group, I'm curious what your opinion is of that. Um, well, Lou makes his living expressing outrageous opinions, or at least it, uh, provocative opinions, I should say. That's the way he drives his ratings. And I think that his verbiage sounded, I, I was not aware of what he'd said. It, that sounds to me a little overheated. You know, I, I, I do think that, that I'm troubled by the trends in media generally where uh, news seems to be opinion driven rather than straight news. Now part of that is, is a result of Fox having been successful with the formula. But I think it's, it's something that, we, that the networks and that, that every news organization needs to be really careful about. Because if we lose our credibility, then we have nothing. And if we aren't going to be fair and honest brokers, and if we aren't going to be equally interested in digging into Obama's past as we are digging into McCain's, then in the long run, run I think we devalue what we're about and we, we hurt our own brand. The question I think that goes through at least some of our minds is, what happened at about 3 o'clock today when the bill was voted down that everybody thought was going? We had 777 young people here this afternoon, which equaled about the amount the Dow fell. So yes. if you could solve that for us, we'd appreciate it, Lisa. If I could solve that for you, I'd be in a different field. Um, I, I think what happened today was Washington it, it rally, it just, in, in some respect, it was a typical day in Washington in, in that politics and partisan politics took precedence over doing the, the country's business. Part of the problem, is, and I would place the blame on both parties, um, they had, there was a fragile agreement that had been put together. They thought they had enough votes, barely, to pass the bill. Speaker Nancy Pelosi gets up and gives a highly partisan speech in the middle of a volatile situation. That apparently cost some votes on the Republican side, people who were going to swallow hard and vote for the plan, even though they were going to get a lot of grief at home. On, on the Republican side, over the, you know, one of the problems with Congress is that as, as districts have been redistricted, you have an increasingly liberal wing of the Democratic Party, an increasingly conservative wing of the Republican Party, and almost no middle ground anymore. So for the conservative wing of the Republican Party, a party which thought it lost the last election because it, it abandoned its own core values on holding down spending and other issues, to suddenly be asked to swallow $700 billion spending program is, in fairness to them, a really hard thing to be asked to do. To make matters worse, they were all hearing overwhelmingly from the folks at home that they didn't want it. Part of the problem there is that this package was sold initially as, a, as something to save Wall Street when it's actually more about saving Main Street. Much of Wall Street's already gone. Um, save Main Street and, and save people who are from losing their homes. But So the pro, the, the the package was not sold very well, and unfortunately, President Bush, when he gave his prime time address, just doesn't have very much credibility anymore. So he didn't, you know, usually, if, if Ronald Reagan gave an address, often it gave the, the people in the House and Senate cover, because Reagan was popular enough, he could sway opinion, and then people would feel like, okay, they could cast a tough vote. So here, President Bush didn't give his, his Republican Party really any air cover there. They're hearing bad things from home. They're really miffed anyway just about their state of life because they, you know, in the minority in the House, you get no, in, in, import, uh, no uh, in, influence on anything. So in the end, about 10 Republicans who they were counting on didn't vote for the bill, and the whole bill went down because... Um, the Democrats had only, were only going to provide X number of votes. They were going to force the Republicans to at least deliver their fair share. So in the end, everyone kind of worried about their own parochial interest, and the country's interest was, uh, got short shrift. 
I don't think there's any question that they're going to have to revisit the issue and that they're going to have to pass something. Uh, you can't just allow the stock market to go down that much. And from, from what I'm hearing anecdotally from members of Congress, this is showing up on Main Street. People who can't get uh, loans to, to meet their payroll or to, to finish a project, uh, all of a sudden no one has any money to lend. So something's going to have to give. It's just too bad it had to be this messy before uh, Congress acted. What role do you think, if any, did sexism play in this um, campaign, in this election season, in the media or in the public's perception of the candidates? I think that, that Hillary Clinton was, I think the media, there was certainly sexism in the, in the media's treatment of Hillary. I think there's been sexism in the media's treatment of Sarah Palin. I don't think that's why Hillary lost. You know, I think Hillary lost because she didn't run a very good campaign. It was a campaign often at war with itself. It really didn't find a good message until the, the nomination was essentially uh, out of reach. And th they basically had only one game plan, which was that she would win the election by Super Tuesday, that she would roll up all the delegates she needed. And when she didn't, Believe it or not, they had no plan B. They, they basically ceded many of the caucus states to Barack Obama, who was well organized, and, and, and that was really the secret to him winning the election, was he went out and rolled up delegates. He did the hard work of getting the delegates, and Senator Clinton's campaign was just always fighting among themselves and strategically just not very... Uh, uh, focused. Uh, in fact, even tactically they weren't very focused. They were just, it, it was a bunch of high-powered people who were always jockeying for advantage and I think did not serve her interests uh, very well. I have heard absolutely nothing about education uh, during the entire political uh, campaign so far and I understand that the economy and the war are very big issues but I still expected to hear something from either of them, but I've heard nothing. Uh, can you comment on that? I think this is Stump the Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, education. I know that Barack Obama favors making education more affordable. He favors more money for early childhood education. Um, I think both candidates have talked about trying to make student loans more affordable. And that is all I can tell you about their positions on education. You're right, it just has not been a major issue in this campaign. And I think, I think the reason, I think it's not because they don't care about the issue, I think it's because it's been such a crowded, I mean, there's just been one huge issue after another and it's not been, um, you know, it's, it's just way down on their agenda. Doesn't mean that, it's also an area I should say that, that the federal government probably has a smaller role in education than in most other issues you deal with. Federal government has a huge role in health care. Federal government has a, has a huge role in, in dealing with veterans um, and, and, in, and in various kinds of regulations. But when it comes to education, the federal government only provides Last I checked, I think it's less than 10% of education funding, which is, you know, everyone's for better education. Um, you know, it's easy for a politician to say they're for better education, more affordable education, but they're real, usually there's not a lot of meat on the bones. This morning, uh, Scott Ritter, the former weapons inspector, reported that by 1996, he and his team had verified conclusively using serial numbers and other things that he checked with the Russians that the missiles that would, be de that would deliver weapons of mass destruction had been destroyed by the Iraqis and apparently a lot of the weapons themselves and yet we were told in the run-up to the Iraq war that uh, they still had them they wouldn't uh, uh, give us the full information on it, but we already had that. And his point was that the Bush administration wanted regime change and was just using that as a means of, 
uh, building popular support. Now we have Iraq, Iran, and uh, which the administration would dearly love to change the regime in. And we hear that uh, there's all sorts of uh, weapons programs that are in secret, but no evidence, just like in the past, no evidence is actually provided to either the public or our allies. And yet both times, the media seems to go along with what uh, is being told by the administration. Now, you seem to be pretty definite yourself in uh, saying that Iran has these secret programs. So do you have evidence of that, or is the media just going along again like they did in the run-up to the Gulf War? Well, first of all, or to on the, the uh, Iraq War. Uh, very good question. Uh, first of all, on Scott Ritter's allegations. President Clinton also believed that Iraq still had weapons of mass destruction. He has said that. Um, he didn't agree with going to war. He didn't think that was the right way to approach to deal with the problem. But President Clinton agree believed that Iraq did have those weapons. When it comes to Iran, um, part, much of the information we've re that is in the public uh, domain comes from the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is an international forum. It is not controlled by us. In fact, we've been at odds with them on any, many issues because uh, the U.S. feels that they've not been aggressive enough. But certainly France has been privy to some of the issues, and, and uh, France, in fact, has taken the lead in some respects. Uh, the, the Europe has taken the lead in some respects in trying to deal with Iran. Uh, thinking that they would have more leverage than, than we do. I mean, I, I think you make a very good point. Um, no one is asking us to go to war with Iran right now. People are trying to do this through peaceful means. But I, you're, you're absolutely right. If, if and when that comes, we should demand to see the evidence. Um, I, there, I think it's a matter of dispute exactly when Iran will have enough enriched uranium to make a bomb. Uh, but the, some, some people believe next year, some people believe 2010, but the International Atomic Agency, which is the one dealing with Iran and who has accused the uh, Iran of stonewalling, does believe that, that Iran's program uh, is not, a nuclear program is not only for pe peaceful purposes. And that is the agency reported that, that it's reported that Iran has done certain things to moving toward building a bomb in the last year. We hinted on the question earlier tonight, and it's about the role of the media. You know, the media play gotcha politics, and it comes down to uh, good people making a decision to run for public office have to have this squeaky clean background. Anything they do is scrutinized, you know, more than 100%, it seems sometimes. So my question is, when does anybody really get a break? And is it so important to the media to always have that provocative clip out there because the commercialization of the media is pretty obvious? So, you know, what is your read on that? Well, I, I share your concern, and I think it does keep good people from going into public service. I, I don't really have a cure for it. Um, you know, I think that... that one of the things we could do a better job of, in particular, I mean, whatever the provocative clip is, is going to be reported. That's just, that is just something you buy into if you go into public life. But I think that what we could do a much better job of is, is perspective. You know, how long ago something happened? What, what the person's record is otherwise? So that, you know, unless it is something, you know, so that unless you're Elliot Spitzer, there ought to be some redeeming you know, it, it, that any transgression ought to be viewed in the context of your larger record. And I think that's what, what politicians who make a mistake, if, if something happens, the, the, you, the, smart, the smartest way to deal with it is just to say, hey, I misspoke, I made a mistake, or I did a really dumb thing, I've learned from it. And people who handle it that way usually can get ahead of it, and it, it doesn't just... Um, destroy whatever they've been trying to build. The people who tend to, to uh, 
to get into trouble, which becomes career threatening, is if they won't admit the mistake, if they deny, um, if when confronted they lie about it. A number of the speakers earlier in the day mentioned Kurdistan as a major in player in the Iraqi area as well as in Iran. Um, what is your feeling about Kurdistan becoming a sovereign state as well as what role do you think and what actions do you think the other nations and surrounding areas would take? We had uh, an intern a couple of years ago who um, was from Kurdistan. He's a Fulbright scholar. Uh, he was a wonderful guy. We hated to lose him. And he went back to be a journalist. And as you know, being a journalist in Iraq can be a very dicey uh, existence. But he had family back there, so he went back. Uh, you know, I think from, from the I'm, – I'm not an expert on, uh, on Iraq, but from what – from the people – from talking to the people who know a lot about the region – they, they believe that the thing that makes the most sense is to give each, each of these areas some degree of autonomy, but keeping them in the, in the, within the Iraqi nation. I know the Kurds want to be off on their own, but the, problem, the minute you da do that, you also have a problem with Turkey. And right now, the U.S., I think, is doing, is, has been very active in being sure that when there are skirmishes between the Kurds and the Turks, that nothing horrible comes of it. Uh, but in terms of, of uh, Kurdistan becoming, I mean, you know, if Iraq, once we leave, erupts in civil war, then I think that, that in a Kurdistan becoming an autonomous country becomes more likely. But I think in the absence of that, there will be an effort to hold that country together. <laughs>